NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel is here, here in America, here in New York. He has just returned from Syria, which is not something that very many people in the world can say right now. We are lucky to have Richard here because he's almost never here. Now, for the last decade, he has reported from Iraq and Afghanistan and Gaza and Lebanon. Uh, at one point, I emailed him to ask if he wanted to get together, and he emailed back that he was on his way to Timbuktu because that's Richard's life. Um, last year, watching the unfolding of the Arab Spring, Richard's reporting from Egypt and then from Libya was just indispensable. Richard was in Tahrir Square the night President Hosni Mubarak relinquished power after 30 years. In Libya, Richard spent months traveling between the rebel stronghold of Benghazi and the other rebel-controlled areas and the capital city of Tripoli. He captured this moment, which made everybody, including me, think that the Libyan rebels' chances of winning against Gaddafi were slightly less than zero. Watch. After an hour and a half driving south, flanked by desert, we reach the rebels' front line. There are no trenches or sandbags, just men poorly armed who want to fight. The front line is about five miles outside the town of Ajdabia. Smoke can be seen rising from Ajdabia in the distance. Qaddafi still has tanks and artillery in the town. The rebels watch with binoculars but can't advance. Outgunned, the rebels say they're killed whenever they approach Qaddafi's forces. We have light weapons. He has tanks, complained one man. Another rebel showed me he isn't actually armed at all. It's a toy gun. This is amazing. He just handed me his gun. I didn't realize until he put it in my hands. It's actually just made of plastic. It's a toy. At that point, and that was March of last year, things did not look good for the rebels in Libya. They were outmanned and outgunned. They were outdone. But then things turned around. NATO's no-fly zone and the air raids paid off militarily. Gaddafi fled and went into hiding. Seven months after Richard showed us the rebel with the plastic gun, Gaddafi was captured and killed. The Arab Spring is now trying to roll through Syria, and it has been incredibly bloody. Exact death tolls are impossible to know at this point because the Bashar al-Assad regime is not publicly keeping count of how many of its own civilians it has killed, and it doesn't want anybody else to either. But best guess estimates put the number of dead in Syria at about 17,000 people over 16 months of fighting. Even after Kofi Annan brokered a ceasefire agreement, the snipers and the shelling did not stop. People are still dying every day in Syria in fighting between the government and the rebels, including at least 30 people killed today in the besieged area of Homs. For 16 months, it has seemed like nothing in Syria would change. But something seems to be happening now. There are increased reports of defections from Syria's military. More than a dozen generals, a deputy minister, a Syrian Air Force pilot flying his jet to Jordan. The military turning against the regime, defecting. The New York Times reporting that of the 80,000 young men expected to show up for their mandatory military service this year, experts say virtually none have responded. And amid those reports, and at a time when it is getting really hard to get reporting out of Syria itself, Richard went to northwest Syria last week, and he says he was surprised by what he found there. Rebels in Syria now travel openly on the main highways, in uniforms, carrying weapons. It was not like this just a month ago. But now the rebels have safe havens, mostly in the rural countryside. The army does not dare come out. If they do, our snipers would get them. Rebel leader Ahmed Bakran takes us to Marara, one of dozens of villages in northwest Syria where residents are now celebrating after government troops were driven out. Things are changing rapidly in Syria, where the opposition is taking village after village. And every time they do, they throw a party just like this one. For the first time in this conflict, there is the sense that the rebels have momentum. The sense that the rebels have the momentum, that is not the way the press about Syria has been in this country up until now. But Richard is just back from there. NBC News senior foreign correspondent, correspondent Richard Engel joins us now live in studio. Uh, Richard, thanks for being here. Oh, wow. It's good to be here with you. How are you? I'm good. Did you have to do one of those James Bond crazy things in order to get into Syria? Um, well, you have to go in illegally. Yeah. Be and we went in through Turkey, and we joined up with some rebels. But the Turks are giving a little bit of passive support. Mm -hmm. If the Turks had seen us, yes, they would have arrested us, and that would have been about it, and they would have sent us back inside. But... I think the Turks did probably see us and because there were a lot of people crossing the border illegally these days and are just looking the other way. And they are allowing rebels and a few journalists to go in. And to give you an idea, I, this wasn't the first time I'd been into Syria. 
And I didn't know exactly what to expect. And now this conflict zone. So I brought almost nothing. I brought a pair of socks, one extra shirt. I wanted to keep myself very light. I thought I'd be hiding under kitchen tables. Mm -hmm. I went in with the rebels at night. We crossed to the other side. Rebel flags, guys walking around in rebel uniforms, on motorcycles. And I spent the next week driving around with the rebel groups from headquarter to headquarter, doing interviews openly on the street, surrounded by people. We stopped for lunch on the way in between, in between, in between villages and hardly saw any Syrian troops at all. How much, how much of the country is Assad in control of then? I don't think very much. Wow. I think he controls the cities and he controls the places where his troops are, but not necessarily much in between them. We went into towns where there were rebels in control of the town, but there were still Syrian forces. And the Syrian forces were isolated to a small section of the town. Don't patrol, don't leave it. I walked by a Syrian checkpoint probably 50 yards away, and I got the same impression. The Syrians didn't want to see us there because they didn't want to have to go out and deal with the situation. There are defectors leaving these little outposts every single day. Sometimes they are asking for the rebels to attack the outpost to give them an opportunity to escape so that their senior officers don't shoot them for defecting. The government side is calling the rebels and say, please attack this outpost so that I can flee in response so what, that I can get away from military service and join you. This is what some defectors who had fleed, had fled were telling us. That is incredible. They're, they're buying, most, by the way, the weapons from the defectors and from their own military. So mm -hmm. the rebels are buying weapons if they have cash from the Syrian army themselves. No two countries are exactly alike, but one of the things that we have all watched in the as the various Arab Spring uprisings have happened have has been we've been watching for that tipping point. The, if the military is an important institution and the military not just for monopoly of force, I think but it's an important point. institution when they start going to the anti-government side, then you pretty much know that the government's going to fall. We saw defections every day. Wow. People showing up every day to join the ranks of the rebels. Bashar al-Assad, I think it's fair to say, does not control the people anymore. He's not president of Syria anymore. He's president of the army, the army that's still loyal. And that's not sustainable for very long. And that's shrinking. As and that's the... shrinking. He's pulled back to the cities. And it's easier to hold certain parts of cities, and he's been very brutal in, in holding them, and he's, there's now fighting in Damascus because the fighting is getting closer to him. But once you lose the people and all the countryside and the villages, it's Not a matter of time. Richard but it could be a long time. His, his weapons are still it's more still impressive time, yeah. and the rebels don't have a lot of weapons. So it could be one of these situations where it's slow, 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 very quick. But we're in a different phase of the moon than we were. Richard Engel, NBC News Chief Foreign Correspondent. It is good to see you in this time zone. It's, an, it's, an, it's incredible reporting. I know you're going to be doing more on Nightly and more on Rock Center. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate it, Richard. All right. Uh, coming up tonight on the interview, we've got an exclusive about cheating, or at least what looks like cheating, uh, in Mitt Romney's home state, the Republican Party doing something really sketchy to try to avoid a big public embarrassment for Mr. Romney. Uh, the wronged party is here tonight for the interview. This should be very interesting.